Hi, everyone, and welcome to AXA Arctic Live. It's wonderful to have you all with us for this live broadcast all about the changing Arctic Ocean. We have schools from the UK, France, Spain, and Ukraine joining us today, and a very special shout out goes to the year nine students who are at King's College in Murcia in Spain. So a couple of bits of admin uh, before we come to the live lesson. To the side of the video, you'll be able to see the chat application. This is where you can post all your questions and we'll come to those towards the end of this broadcast. If we go over anything and it's a bit too fast or you don't quite understand, we will try to answer any clarification questions during the live broadcast. Now, if you'd like to keep the video full screen at the front of the classroom, you can click on the full screen option in the bottom right hand corner of the player. If you also want to have the Q&A app, uh, we'll also have a short poll during the lesson. You can always view that on a second device, such as a smartphone or tablet. If at any point during the live lesson you have technical difficulties, there is a support contact button at the bottom right of each page of the Encounter EDU website. Just click on the speech bubble and you'll be able to contact a member of the support team. Now, today is all about the changing Arctic Ocean. Normally, we would be up in Nyolesund. Um, that is an island um, on an island called Svalbard, and that is halfway between the top of Norway and the North Pole. That's been our base for AXA Arctic Live over the past six, seven years, I think now. And we have been studying how the ocean is changing during that period. For obvious reasons, we haven't been able to travel northwards uh, this year, very much hoping we can get up there next year. But it's my great delight to welcome Dr. Helen Finley from the Plymouth Marine Laboratory to talk to you and work with us as we explore the changing Arctic Ocean. Good morning, Helen. Good morning. Good morning, Jamie. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you. Um, Helen, we, we, we met on the ice many, many um, <laughs> moons ago, and I don't think I saw you without 28 layers of, you know, sort of clothing on until sort of, you know, a month later when we're sort of in jeans and a T-shirt and a hotel, sort of getting rid of all our sort of built up grime o over that time. But fantastic to have you on Axe Arctic Live again. Thanks for having me. And it's a pleasure. Yes, it's um, always nice to see people when they're looking slightly normal, when they've not got their puffy jackets on and things. So great to see you again. And today we are going to do a few things. We're going to do some subject knowledge, I think, up front. We're going to talk about gas, a concept and a process. Uh, then we're going to do two short investigations, uh, looking at the process of something called ocean acidification, which I know you're going to cover shortly, and then how it might affect life that is in the ocean. And then, of course, time for some questions um, at the end, all about Arctic science, the ocean, uh, what it's like to be in this wonderful, wonderful part of the world. So, Helen, just starting off, we've we've got this sort of some background subject knowledge, I think, just to share with those young people, those classes watching. Um, first of all, we're going to be talking a lot today about a gas, carbon dioxide. Can you just give a, a quick refresher um, for those classes watching? Yeah, sure. So carbon dioxide is a gas. Um, a gas is some a, a molecule or molecules that float around in the air around us that we can't see. So air is made up mostly of oxygen and nitrogen, but in there as well is also a little bit of carbon dioxide. So it's naturally around in our in the in the world system in the atmosphere. The problem with carbon dioxide is that we also release it as a gas from processes, so from cars or from industry um, and things like that. And so it gets taken out of those um, those places from industry, from cars, and goes into the atmosphere as well. Um, it also comes out of us naturally, so we breathe out carbon dioxide and we breathe in oxygen. Um, so again, it's kind of this natural gas that's around um, and is, is a really useful um, gas to have in the atmosphere because actually 
without carbon dioxide and gases like it, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, we call them, the atmosphere would actually not be as warm as we have it today. And that means that we actually probably wouldn't survive as well as we do on this planet. So it has its uses. Um, but it, it has problems as well. I don't know if we want to go into those now or whether we should... Uh, well, I mean, I think we just, just hearing you speak there, um, Helen, perhaps we can jump straight into this process that we're going to be looking at a lot today, um, the process of ocean acidification. And I think that um, classes watching may have come across the concept of um, climate change or the climate crisis, one of the impacts of increased levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere but you're going to be sharing uh, another impact that it has. Yeah, so we, we've all heard about, well, or hope, hopefully a lot of people have heard about um, greenhouse gases and the, the impacts that they're having on climate um, warming the planet. So as I said, these greenhouse gases actually take up some of the heat that comes from the sun and that makes the atmosphere warmer. So that's about climate change and that's changing the weather patterns and the systems that we know on the planet. But the carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere around us actually also gets taken up again by other things. So the trees, they're a carbon sink, we call them, but also the ocean is a carbon sink and it's a massive carbon sink. So it takes up that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and it soaks it up into the oceans. And normally that's okay on really, really long time scales. What happens is that carbon dioxide um, can be buffered. What we call buffering is when something can come in and, and soak it up, if you like, a bit like a sponge soaking up that carbon dioxide. So the oceans can naturally take up some of that. The problem is that we're adding so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and then into the oceans so quickly that the oceans aren't able to buffer that. They aren't able to absorb and soak up as much carbon dioxide as we'd hoped. And that's resulting in a change in the ocean chemistry. And that's what we call ocean acidification. So carbon dioxide going into the ocean um, actually can react with water. And I think we maybe have a slide on this. Um, so carbon dioxide goes into the ocean, it reacts with water, and that um, produces a weak acid, and that acid's called carbonic acid. And it's that production of that acid which is actually changing the chemistry in the ocean and making the ocean more acidic. And, and Helen, you, you, you're using some sort of science words here, using sort of acidic and acidity and acidification. Uh, is, is, is that something that we can measure? Um, is, is, is there a sort of a chemical basis for that? Yeah, so very much like temperature is measured on the scale, um, usually these days in, in degrees Celsius. So we have zero is where water will freeze. Um, and then above zero is, is kind of hot temperatures or below zero is normally called freezing. So very much like that temperature scale, we have a pH scale, which is a scale of how acidic something is. And, and very much, again, like temperature, we use water as our sort of middle point, if you like. So when water is, has got a pH of seven, so that's neutral. It's, it's not acidic. It's not uh, what we call alkali. But if we, I think we've also got a slide on this. Um, so pH seven is pure water. If you add more acid to that, you become more acidic and it goes towards the kind of soft drinks, lemon juice, things like that. You go down the scale towards um, pH, say two. If you, become, if you take away the acid and you become what we call more alkali, then you go up the scale towards the things like soap or bleach and that's um, going up the scale towards pH 12. Um, when we're talking about the oceans becoming more acidic, the oceans are actually already slightly alkali. They have a pH of around about 8.1 or so. I actually have some seawater here with me, um, which I can just measure the pH with. Hopefully my pH meter will turn on again. It's just turned itself off. Um, and we can actually, I can actually show you the pH um, of seawater. I'll just... So I'll just hold that up, hang on a second. So let's see, pH meter is just turning on, but here's my bottle of seawater that I collected uh, from the lab when I was in um, the lab yesterday. And I've just got my pH, fancy pH meter here. It's just turning itself on, it just went to sleep. But hopefully you can see there, 
the pH is around about 8.2. Yep. Okay, so that's what seawater is. So you can see it's slightly more alkali than uh, pure water. And so when we're talking about um, adding carbon dioxide and making it more acidic, what we're actually doing is just making it slightly more acidic, so towards pH 7. And this is never going to be a grand change. We're not going to end up at pH 6 or 5 or 4, but we are going to kind of see a shift that is um, a very is dramatic in terms of what the ocean has experienced in the past. Helen, we're going to do a couple of investigations to see if we, we can acidify our own mini oceans, um, both together and, and for those watching in the classroom. You, you talk about a sort of shift like from 8.2 to 8.1. Now, I know this is a slightly complex um, <laughs> bit of science, but that 0.1 of a unit isn't like a sort of change in one degree or 0.1 of a degree in, in, in terms of temperature. It, it's actually a little bit different. Yeah, so, so pH is a, a measure of acidity. It's a log scale, which means that everything is amplified by, by 10, essentially, every time you move down a unit. Um, so a pH change from 8.2 to 8.1 is only 0.1 of a pH change, but actually equates to about 30% more acidic. Um, so it's quite a significant change in terms of what the ocean is used to seeing. So the oceans at the moment around on average, around about 8.1. Um, you can see our pH meter was showing 8.2, so perhaps Plymouth water, I mean, it's been sat in, in the bottle for a while. There might be some photosynthesis going on, releasing carbon dioxide, um, changing that, sorry, taking up carbon dioxide, changing that. Um, but before we had any, any industry going on, before we had the Industrial Revolution, the global average pH was about 8.2. Um, so we have already seen a drop in that pH levels. Um, and actually, before we go on to experiments, I think maybe there's a slide that just shows how we can, how we've seen that um, change happen. So we can measure pH in the, um, sorry, we can measure CO2 in the atmosphere. And I think what you're seeing is um, a graph with time along the bottom axis, and then a red line going up. Um, which shows the atmospheric increase in CO2. And then there's a blue, uh, dark blue sort of wobbly line, um, and that shows this, the water CO2 going up. So that's um, CO2 measured in the seawater itself. And then there's a blue, a light blue line that's wobbling going down. And you can see that that's showing a trend of pH going down. So that's seawater pH. So that's the change that we've actually been able to measure over the past 30 to 40 years at these long-term observation stations that we have several of around the world now. And, and, and just on a technical point, the wibbly-wobbly nature of, of two of those lines is because of the natural process of photosynthesis taking part in the ocean and how that changes from season to season so that those processes sort of it's, it's, it's not sort of someone's got the instruments wrong it's a natural <laughs> process that's exactly right yeah so if you were to space those those data points out a little bit what you see is a really nice seasonal cycle where you have much lower co2 levels or, or higher pH um, in the summertime and vice versa in the winter time because of that photosynthesis um, and respiration processes yeah Brilliant. Thank you so much, Helen, for that sort of subject knowledge sort of like update before we start our two investigations. The first one I think we're going to do together is we're going to see whether the carbon dioxide, uh, when we breathe out, we have increased levels of carbon dioxide in our breath. If we um, take a glass and a straw and we, and we blow through water, what's going to happen to the pH of that water? So for those of you who are doing this uh, with us in the classroom, a couple of points. Um, don't have your glass too full. If you have it very full when you blow and it makes bubbles that can spill. Um, blow in a constant and, and steady way. Uh, don't share straws. Uh, and if you can, use reusable straws that are then um, can be used again and sort of washed um, then please think about the amount of uh, litter you might be creating. But so there are a few, few points up front. Helen, um, I imagine that we should do a little test of our pH, and there's a variety of different ways that you can, you can test pH. 
not everyone's got a sort of wonderful meter that you mm -hmm. have. So, I mean, there's some indicator strips or litmus papers or other things that may be common in, in a science classroom. Yeah, litmus paper, I think, um, is quite common. You can also make your own pH indicator dye at home. If you want to have a go, um, you need some adult supervision, but just um, you need to cut up some red cabbage and boil it up and uh, take the juices of that, and that acts as an indicator dye. So you can actually um, see the pH change. Um, I can actually do a demonstration of that if you have, if you want to do that quickly. Yeah. I um, so I actually have... This is just pure water with pH indicator dye in the cabbage. Um, and we have a few uh, other bits uh, of uh, uh, Sort of like in the middle there? Yeah, so it's a nice purple colour, I think. Hopefully you can see that. Brilliant. Um, and then we can you can actually change the pH of that um, if you add different things. So I can have a go at doing that now, or we can... Well, let, 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 let's see yeah. what, what happens, happen, happens towards the end. One quick point, if you are making red cabbage pH indicator at home or at school, um, if you can open the windows, um, that's always a good, <laughs> the doors, it's always a good idea because it can get quite stinky. Um, so um, what I would like you to do, and we can get a poll up now, is, is predict and, and um, prediction and hypothesizing, as I use the technical word, is an important part of the scientific process. Um, so predict what will happen to the pH as we add carbon dioxide to our many oceans. So will it stay the same? Uh, will the pH decrease or will the pH increase? So have a little uh, prediction on the poll that's coming up to the side of the screen here uh, or on a smartphone and have a think about what might happen. Um, just before we, we, we start adding carbon dioxide and, and measuring sort of the pH to start off with, why are predictions and hypothesis so important in science, Helen? Well, science is really based on trying to improve our understanding of something. So most of the time, if you, if you think about what you don't know, first of all, you kind of, you assume you don't know anything as a scientist, um, and you go out and try to find out what is going on. So you can have, you can have a best guess of my, what might be happening, and that is your hypothesis. So you might say, I think that um, the oceans are taking up carbon dioxide and that that's changing pH. Um, but then I would have to do rigorous testing to actually prove that that was the case. And that's where we have our monitoring, that's where we have laboratory experiments, uh, understanding of physics and chemistry. So the, the, the theoretical understanding of the physics of how the climate works, how temperature and gases interact, that's all kind of builds that hypothesis, that builds that ability to make a good guess about what might happen. And then when we go out and do that test, we can actually say, Yes, that lends evidence to that um, hypothesis, which means that it supports the hypothesis, um, or it completely disagrees with that hypothesis. And we can throw that idea away, or maybe take it and develop it a bit and start again with the, something else. Or we can build on that to kind of to further the understanding and further that science. So we kind of start at that, what do we not know? How can we really find out and prove something is, is really going on? Right, well, Helen, I've got no idea what's going to happen to my mini ocean. I don't know whether you know what's going to happen. I think you may have some ideas about what's going to happen to your mini ocean. I've, I've got my pH meter in here. Um, so what have you got? You've got 6.98. Um, yeah. I have 6.92 on my one, on my meter. I don't know what you've got in the classroom. But what we're going to do now, I'm just going to turn the meter off. And uh, a minute, do you reckon? A minute of bubbles? Yeah, let's go for a minute. Let's go for a minute. See what okay, happens. we're going to get counted down on a minute, starting whenever the wonderful Ellie, who's, who's producing, tells us to start. Okay, in three, two, one, go. <laughs>
That's halfway. Twenty seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and stop. Wow. Well, there, there we go. Um, so, if we use our prior knowledge, we know that we have carbon dioxide, increased levels of carbon dioxide when we breathe out. We have seen some evidence from Hawaii, in fact, that increased levels of carbon dioxide in the ocean make a decrease in pH. I always find it very confusing. Decrease in pH is an increase in acidity. Um, I always just remember those two. So um, I'm not quite sure what um, your predictions were. So well, let's have a quick look. Um, so it will decrease. A couple of people saying all the say the same will increase. But many of you saying um, that the pH will decrease. So let's have a little look um, here. So I had 6.92 um, to start off with. I don't know whether that's in focus for so 6.07. Six point zero six. How do you get on? I started with 6.98, I think, and that's 6.3 something. 3.8. Next, next, next time, Helen, we should, we should, we should, we should have a, uh, a um, prediction on, on whose who's water is going to <laughs> He's got the most stinky <laughs> breath. Lots of different factors involved. Um, so, you know, we asked the question, what will happen to the pH of the water if we add CO2? And, and what, what kind of conclusion do you think, that just from this tiny little um, investigation, what kind of conclusions can we start to draw? And how many times would you have to do that um, to, 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 to make it sort of like robust science experiment? Um, so I think that's, that's quite a good decrease in CO2, that, in, in pH, sorry, that we had there. It, we made it... Um, quite a significant amount more acidic. So I'd say that's quite a good conclusion. Um, but yeah, to make it robust, you would have to repeat that um, quite a few number of times. Um, I mean, it, it depends on the stats, but what you want to be doing is making sure that um, every time you repeat it, you're getting the same results. Um, and what we talk about is, is kind of confidence levels. So you can kind of have some times that it doesn't work but for the majority of times it does work and normally what we talk about is 95% of the time it works that happens so 95% of the time you would see that change um, in pH um, and then if there was a little bit of error say some of the water maybe had something in it um, that was changing the pH you can explain those errors away with other things that might be going on so yeah a few more repeats I think if every child watching did that that would be a really good uh, statistical analysis <laughs> and so maybe we'll, we can we'll try, we'll try and see what, what we get in terms of I don't know whether whether we can get instead of questions just in, in that chat box to find out how many results if you have done this um, at at home or in the classroom, how many of you saw a decrease in pH and increase in acidity? Helen, I'm just going to sort of move us on a bit to, to thinking about um, why why this matters um, to, to to life um, in the ocean, uh, and I've just got a. Um, Bit of chalk here, and we're going to do another little investigation. How, how, how does chalk relate to life in the ocean? So, chalk is actually made up of tiny microscopic plants called coccolithophores. So, all the chalk that you use in the classroom or that comes from the White Cliffs of Dover in England, for example, or um, lots of other places have limestone and chalk, that's all. Um, really old 
um, tiny, tiny microscopic plants that live in the ocean called um, phytoplankton called co coccolithophores. And they have these calcified shells um, that when, uh, when they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean, they get squashed together um, and eventually form rocks. Um, and that's really important because actually it's those rocks that can buffer changes of acidity in the ocean. So on these really long timescales that we're talking about, geological timescales, thousands and thousands of years, that weathering of those rocks stops the pH in the ocean from being too variable. It, it doesn't change too much over those sort of timescales, which is why this is such a big issue at the moment, because we are changing the um, pH, the acidity of the oceans, at such a, at, at more than, I think, um, it's something like 10 times faster than we've seen in the last, um, basically since, since the kind of extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So that's that, that rate of change that is not able to be buffered by these long-term processes like weathering of these rocks. Um, and so many animals and plants that have evolved, that live in the oceans, have evolved in that stable pH, and they haven't experienced this sort of pH change that we're experiencing now. Um, and so just like humans rely on a stable body temperature and in fact a stable blood pH level, um, if, if, you, if as a person you have your blood pH change very much, it can just change by a tiny, tiny amount, um, it can make you very sick and you would end up having to go to hospital. And it's the same for many organisms and, and plants and animals that live in the sea. And many of them actually rely on the ocean pH to kind of dictate their temperature and their internal pH as well. And so any changes to that seawater pH can actually have knock-on consequences for what's going on inside them. Um, but not only that, but these calcified organisms, so any of these coccolithophores or other animals, so I think there's a couple of pictures of some other animals. We have here um, a pteropod, um, and this is a snail. It's a free swimming snail, um, which so just like snails that you would find on the beach or in fact in your garden, they have these calcified shells um, and they're the same as these coccolithophores that end up as chalk. Um, and they actually will start to dissolve away in acidic conditions. So if you if they get to a level where it's it's um, what we call corrosive, so it starts to dissolve um, these um, shells. Uh, then that can be problematic for these animals. They have to put in more energy to repair their shells, more energy to build them. Um, and so there's all sorts of creatures that that can affect. Um, maybe you guys can come can think of some as well, but just as there's some examples, you've got these pteropods here, um, and we've got things like coral reefs. Um, they're a big one. Um, all of the coral that uh, there is... is um, is made up of these calcium carbonate um, structures, oysters, clams, mussels, things like that, that we all eat, um, possibly. <laughs> um, they all have these structures as well. So there's many types of animals that could be affected in several different ways by acidification. Um, I think maybe we have a video actually of a pteropod um, dissolving. So this is just a pteropod by a colleague of mine um, who studies these um, and she was actually able to find pteropods um, in the oceans today that are already showing these signs of dis dissolution. So they're living in a world in some places of the ocean today that is already starting to affect their shells. Um, so that's something we use these pteropods as a, what we call an indicator um, for being able to observe change on animals um, in relation to ocean acidification. And then I've, I've got a, um, a bit of chalk here. So that's the same sort of mineral, the same chemical composition that is used, as you're saying, by a variety of different living things, all the way from the beautiful pteropod, which I think are, are absolutely wonderful, um, to um, other animals that um, students may know a little bit better, such as um, oysters, mussels, and other shellfish. Do, do we include uh, crabs and lobsters in, in, in that group? Yeah, so crabs and lobsters as well. Um, 
they're slightly less um, likely to be affected as the adults because they have um, a lot of they have a different way of building their shells and structures and they have what we call chitin they have a lot of that as well which kind of helps to protect them so it's not quite as um, as uh, susceptible I guess to dissolution um, so but they're definitely still um, potentially impacted yeah I mean, I've, I've got a sort of a, a bit of a sort of catering pack of, of, of vinegar here. Um, vinegar is, is it's pretty acidic. Um, it's, it's nowhere um, near what we are predicting the oceans are going to become in terms of uh, acidity levels. It's going to be much more acidic than that. But if I add it to this, to this glass with um, a bit of chalk in it, it, or am I sort of pu pu putting something on sort of like massive fast forward about what, what might potentially occur? Yeah, so this, this demonstration really just shows um, how an acid can dissolve away these structures. And, and what you're seeing if you do this is that the, the acid is, is being taken, is dissolving the calcium carbonate because they want to react together. They want to kind of, the calcium carbonate, structure wants to soak up those hydrogen ions that are in the acidic that in this acidic vinegar um, and you see bubbles coming up and that's actually co2 being released um, because this reaction is happening so rapidly so yeah it's basically a speeded up version of what would be going on in the ocean if we were to do it to an extreme level so, so all, all, all this bubble is, is a chemical reaction that's massively sped up um, but is is that that process of dissolving, um, it, and you're saying that's already happening with some species in our ocean, such as the pteropod. Um, but I mean, you're talking about other ones where they're, they're, they're just because living things aren't bits of rock, they can actually do a little bit about what's going on. Can you briefly explain about if, if you've got to work hard to sort of counter you know this this action what, what, what are you missing out on yeah that's right so organism animals aren't lumps of chalk and i use that line quite a lot in some of my talks that i give um because what we have to remember is it's not just a chemical reaction there's some biology going on there as well so animals uh, what they do is they they need energy just like we do we need food to give us energy to grow to move about to breathe to metabolize to do all those processes and to be able to function at a very normal level we need a certain amount of energy and we don't want to have too too many stresses going on. If animals get stressed, so if you put them in acidified conditions or if you give them, um, if they make it more difficult for their shells to, to grow, if you um, start to dissolve away their shells, then that changes that energy budget. And what they can do is try and get more energy and actually try and counter that effect. And that's fine if there's plenty of food available. And there is some evidence to show that if you feed these animals more, then they are actually able to, to build their shells more and they're able to keep up with this stress. But if you if they're not able to feed more, if there's uh, impacts either that the food isn't um, there for them or if the actually the way they feed is impacted, because that can also happen, then actually what you might see is that they don't grow as much, they don't get as big, they're maybe not able to breathe as well as they used to be able to do in different conditions. So it can have kind of knock-on consequences, what we would say, knock-on um, processes to the energy budget and the way that that budget is split up into the functions that it needs to survive. And ultimately what that means is that populations or, or species as a whole can be... Um, negatively impacted so it can affect their survival ultimately and that means that you're getting some species which will not be able to survive at all in these conditions and actually some species that do very well in these conditions as well because they're able to kind of adjust and, and live with it and so they can come in and take some of those resource space as well so you get what we call winners and losers in the situation. Thank you very much, Helen. I've got, got a gentle fizzing happening, ha happening next to me, but we've got some great questions um, that have come through from those classes watching. Um, so you, the first one is how does the acidification affect the animals? And I think you, you've talked about that um, in, in, in great detail. Um, 
Do, does does it also affect you know animals sort of like mammals and fish and and those kind of animals that, that don't have this sort of um, calcium carbonate structure that have to put energy into that? Yeah, so um, like I was saying, in, in terms of the pH of your blood, so directly any animal that has an internal pH that it's got to maintain could potentially be affected by a change in the external pH just because of the way that um, balance in the ocean works. So um, even with fish, it has been found that some um, direct effects of this acidity can impact the, the way fish larvae especially so the the juveniles of the fish because they've maybe not got as much resources um as the adults do to to survive that so so um certainly in what we call the early life stages so things like eggs the larvae of those species they're they're much more susceptible to acidification than some of the the adults are um, but also you get knock-on effects. So even if, say, a walrus, for example, this is your classic Arctic food web here, you've got um, phytoplankton at the bottom. Those phytoplankton are, are um, photosynthesizing plants, essentially, that, that grow in the ocean. They get eaten by what we call zooplankton, so they're the tiny little microscopic animals that float around in the sea. And those get eaten by clams. Now, clams, um, we know, are going to be susceptible to acidification. They have these shells, so they're likely to dissolve in some conditions. And they're also potentially impacted in other ways. But those clams are actually one of the key food sources for walruses. So if those clams are affected, then walruses are affected indirectly, even if they're not uh, going to be affected directly by acidification itself. So there's kind of the food web things that we need to think about as well. That's great. Thank you so much for broadening that out into sort of looking at our interconnected world. <laughs> um, the, the, the next question is is really interesting. It's it's about ocean acidification. Is it is it a sort of uniform issue across the world's ocean, um, or is it uh, more of a local problem? And and I know that we've we've come up to this wonderful environment to investigate it on a number of occasions. So that's a really great question um, as well. The 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 problem of ocean acidification is happening globally. Um, so the, the atmospheric CO2 carbon concentration is going up everywhere around us, and that's going into the ocean everywhere around us. So we talk about these kind of global average changes, but just like temperature or climate change regionally and at local levels, it is different and it will happen at different rates because there's quite a lot of different processes. We talked a little bit about how photosynthesis and respiration can affect CO2 and pH. And so on a, on a very local scale, there's a few other things um, that can also affect the local pH as well. And so you need to take those into account when, when we're studying that local environment. So there's, there's things that we can, so on a, a global scale, we're talking about CO2 emissions and, and um, the gas coming out of industry and cars and the things that we're doing. But on local levels, there's there's some natural processes as well that go on that we need to think about when we're talking about local acidification. Really, and and why, why, is, why is the Arctic a good place to study ocean acidification and, and what, what happens sort of here? So the Arctic is one of the places that's changing most rapidly of anywhere on our planet. Um, and that's not only to do with temperature, but also this acidification issue. And that really comes down to the fact that this, the Arctic has a lot of fresh water coming in. Um, so there's some really big rivers that come into the Arctic and they bring with them fresh water um, from, those, from the land. And also you've got, obviously, you've got the sea ice um, and the sea ice is melting. And we know that over the last 30, 40 years, we've lost a lot of the sea ice cover. So there's two things there that affect the acidity. The fresh water actually, if you think about it, the fresh water that we've seen in our fresh water from our taps here was pH 7, roughly. Where, so that's already adding acidity to what is um, to the ocean. So that's kind of a double whammy, if you like, of changing how that process works. And then the loss of the ice cover, actually, when you have ice over the ocean, it almost acts as a cap on the ocean and stops any gas exchange going on. So if you cap that ocean, you potentially stop the CO2 from going in. If you take away that cap because you've, you've lost the sea ice, then you're allowing more carbon dioxide to go into the ocean as well. 
Yes, Helen, I think first time we've only got time for, for a couple more questions. <laughs> um, if, as the ocean is so big and scientists only test a tiny bit, how reliable are the estimates on changes in pH? So that's a, a, a great question, one that we're working really hard to um, actually answer, I guess, as, as a science community. So we've got these what we call long-term stations. So we've seen the data from Hawaii, but there's several other of those long-term stations. But we also have a lot of um, spot measurements from what we call research cruises or people going out in the field. Um, and since about the 1970s or 80s, there's been a huge increase in the number of measurements being taken. And yes, we still only have spot measurements of, of a lot of the places in the ocean and some parts of, say, the Pacific, which is such a big ocean that it's so difficult to measure everything going on. But we were able to have a really good idea from those measurements globally what's going on. And then there's two other things that we can also do. We can always use models. Um, and we know a lot about the physics and the chemistry. We know how that process works. And we can put those into models and actually make uh, what we call hindcast. So that's looking back in time and then comparing that to the, to the data to see how well that works. And then we can also forecast so we can look into the future and see how that might change in the future. And that can give us this global view. And then we're also working quite excitingly, this is very new work, as using satellites to actually fill in some of those gaps that we can't use um, the in situ that what we call the in situ the field data from and that's um something that is is very common in the scientific world we're just starting to get to grips with how we can actually use satellites to fill in those gaps and Helen, just for the last question just to clarify a scientific model is is a sort of a, a computerized sort of simplification of how the world works and then you can sort of enter different sort of variables or factors into it and, 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 and then see how your computerized world works? That's exactly right, yeah. Sorry, so I should explain. It's a computerized version. Um, it's almost like a, a video game, I guess, if you like, where you've and you've come up with your representation of the world. It's, it's a lot simpler than the real world because you can't have all the processes in. It would be very difficult to model. Um, but it's got the important processes in. And that allows you to play around with what might happen or, or how what happens if we change something. Yeah. Thank you. And, and the last question, and um, this is from um, St. John's Academy as well, is, is looking at what we can all do to address the issue of ocean acidification. And I, I'm probably for, for, for many um, young people also sort of like this, maybe the first time they've heard about this issue. So I think that the key thing is, is that we have to reduce our, CO2 emissions um, and that's easy for me to sit here and say it's very difficult for us all to do. The best thing that you can do is tell people about it and communicate, use your voices, use your ability to, to write letters to your MPs or draw pictures, use art, to use any kind of skills that you enjoy doing, use your passion if you want to get into science then, then use that as well. But use your knowledge and what you learn from these sorts of events and what you learn in school to actually use, then use your voice and speak out about it. Tell your parents, talk to your local communities if you can, um, talk to the other members of your school that haven't maybe been able to come to this and actually get that message out here that this is another issue that needs us to reduce our carbon emissions. And then we can work together as a community, we can work with our governments, we can work with the industry, we can work with everybody involved to actually really find a solution for that. Thank you so, so much, Helen, uh, for those great words at the end, that call, call, call to action and call to sharing. Um, thank you also for taking us through some really important uh, uh, pieces of science from sort of talking about carbon dioxide to the process of acidification, definitely clearing up for me uh, the pH scale and how that works and how we measure the, these changes. And then working through, through those two investigations to really see that link between atmospheric, for want of a better word, carbon dioxide, and then the changes in the acidity, the increase in acidity, the lowering of pH in our oceans, and then also um, looking at how it affects um, life, not just a fizzing lump of chalk, but potentially, you know, many other different living things in the ocean 
in that wonderful interconnected uh, web of life. Thank you again, Helen. Thank you to all those classes and students who have taken part in this live lesson. And it's for now a goodbye from AXA Arctic Live. Bye-bye.